Was für ein Land ist Japan? Viele beschreiben es als Land der Farben und Lichter. Mit Großstädten, die direkt aus einem Ridley Scott Film stammen könnten. Einige sehen Japan wiederum als Land der Extreme, in dem Tradition und Moderne Hand in Hand gehen. Andere nehmen Japan hingegen ausschließlich digital wahr. Als Ursprung tausender Welten, die uns seit Jahrzehnten unterhalten, herausfordern und begleiten. Und genauso werden sie hier in diesem Land präsentiert. In Japan sind Videospiele Gesellschaft, Tradition, aber vor allem Geschichte. Dieser Geschichte möchten wir mit Made in Japan besondere Aufmerksamkeit widmen. Dafür reisen wir quer durchs Land, sprechen mit Entwicklern über ihre Arbeit und versuchen herauszufinden, welchen Einfluss die japanische Videospielkultur auf das interaktive Medium hat. Was für ein Land Japan genau ist, wird jeder mit seinen eigenen Eindrücken anders beschreiben. Wir haben drei Entwicklern diese Frage gestellt und uns ihre Geschichten angehört. Japan zählt heute diverse Studios, die sich tagtäglich mit der Entwicklung von Videospielen beschäftigen. Die größten dieser Entwickler dürften den meisten Spielefans ein Begriff sein. Square Enix, Capcom, Sony und Nintendo entwickeln in diversen Großstädten Japans die neuesten Ableger ihrer bekanntesten Marken. Bevor aber der westliche Markt in den Genuss dieser Titel kommt, müssen die japanischen Texte dieser Spiele zunächst lokalisiert werden. Dabei kommt es nicht selten vor, dass Entwickler die Hilfe von Lokalisierungsfirmen in Anspruch nehmen, die ihren Fokus auf die Übersetzung von Videospielen gelegt haben. 84 gehört in Japan zu den bekanntesten dieser Übersetzungsfirmen. Mitgegründet wurde das kleine Unternehmen im Herzen Tokios von John Ricciardi, einem Amerikaner, dessen Leidenschaft für die japanische Videospielwelt als Teenager begann und ihn mit seiner Arbeit als Journalist endgültig nach Japan brachte. My first time was in 1997 for, it was September, so it must have been for TGS, I guess. And I remember going to visit, um, part of that trip was a tour to visit Konami. Konami had all these different game studios at the time. They had Kobe and Osaka and Tokyo and, and Japan. Like they had like five different Konamis, I think. And, uh, and I got to meet like Hideo Kojima. I got to meet like Koji Igarashi. I got to meet all these people who are now like legends, but back then nobody really knew who they were. And so my first impression was like, this place is magical. Like you get to meet, like these are like some of my heroes or whatever. And like, I'm, I remember I tell this story a lot, but at that first trip we were having dinner one night and like this like unassuming quiet, like salary man guy sitting across from me at the table. And like, not till like two hours in did it come out that he was the guy who made Contra. Like he just, he's the guy who made Contra for, uh, for the NES. And I was just like, like my mind blown like I couldn't believe you'd have access to like these kind of you know creators and so magical is the word I would I would use that's what it felt like back then I know like when I was a kid well kid I was like 16 or 17 I um, started getting interested in Japan because I wanted to play Dragon Quest V We didn't have a lot of uh, fans of that series in America, and after the fourth one, like it just fizzled out. They didn't bring the fifth one over, and so I was like, okay, I'm going to import the Japanese version. So I imported the Japanese version, bought an adapter for my Super Nintendo, picked up a Japanese dictionary, and I still remember like I cut the pages out of the open beginning of the dictionary, like with the hiragana and katakana charts, and I like taped them to my desk in front of me, so that like while I'm playing Dragon Quest, I have access to like because I thought it was going to be easy like that. It wasn't easy like that. But um, that basically got me interested in Japanese. Like before that, I didn't really, I just knew Japan was a place where like most of my electronics came from. That's sort of where it all started. That like kickstarted my interest in Japan. And then, you know, I, I, I realized, hey, like all the games I've loved throughout my life are from Japan. And like, then I started like, you know, looking into kind of like, why is that? And then it's like, oh, well, Japan has all these amazing artists and game creators and blah, blah, blah. I thought I would just, you know, try it for a year. In fact, when I came, that was my plan. When I moved here in 2000, it was like, we'll just do it for one year and see what happens. That was 17 years ago, so, yeah. So 8.4 came to be because, so I met Hiroko, my partner, at a previous company. So after the, the dot-com bubble thing blew up and I had to find a job in Japan, 
there was this guy who I had met um, from uh, uh, you know my previous travels or whatever with Japan, and he had a small company, and so he asked me to join his company to kind of help him out. So I did that for a little while. Uh, it wasn't any big company. It was just they did like game licensing and stuff, and um, that's where I met Hiroko. Hiroko actually worked there previously, and she ended up quitting before me. Um, but you know, when we were working together, we, we talked a bunch about like, oh, it'd be cool to like, because we were doing a bunch of other stuff that we weren't really interested in. But like, we also did game localization there. Like, I that's where I did like some of my first jobs. Like, I uh, worked on Xenosaga there and uh, Tales of Symphonia and some you know kind of classic games. And it was like from there we had kind of talked about maybe we could you know do this ourselves someday because we weren't really into the working for another company thing. We want to kind of do it ourselves. And uh, and that conversation went on for like three or four years and then at some point like the timing worked out where like she was ready to move on from her current job. I had just moved on from my previous job and it was like well why don't we team up now and do this. Like she has her experience in the industry here, I have my experience in the industry in the west. Like if we come together maybe we can do something cool. And that's kind of how the idea came to be. Auch wenn der Aufenthalt ursprünglich nicht von Dauer geplant war, stellte sich für John schnell heraus, dass er seine Fähigkeiten nutzen kann, um in der japanischen Games-Industrie Fuß zu fassen. Dafür ließ er sich von seiner Zeit als Journalist inspirieren und fand sich unter anderem in der Lokalisierung von Videospielen wieder. That connection with the, with the users, like the players, the, the people who basically bought our magazine, was really fulfilling because we would get lots of feedback from people who really liked, you know, our opinions or our articles or our magazine or whatever and it was like oh you can you know make people feel good by by actually expressing your enthusiasm for something or whatever and that little thing sort of carried over here because when we when we when I got here and I was working at that small company I didn't want to do licensing for games or whatever that's boring to me and like but I was like well what could I do that would be interesting and it's like well Here's a bunch of games that you know are coming into English, but they, their English is terrible. Like the, the localizations are not very good. The localization was very young at the time. Like it's much more mature now. Um, and I, I'd like to think, in part, because of some of the efforts we made too, to kind of grow the industry and educate developers here on like how to work on games and translate their stuff. But you know, um, we basically saw. I saw like an opening there for like, okay, well, I could put my writing skills to the te to to use by you know helping improve the quality of these localizations. In turn, we're doing something for the, the fans, the players, the users, because they're going to get better games, because I, as a player, also wanted better localizations in my games. And so like, it's kind of like a win-win thing. I can kind of keep that, that connection with players that made me happy in, my, in the magazine days. I could help improve the quality of localizations of games, which is important, and then also maybe educate the industry. Because that was not as much now because like I said it's matured, but when we started out, a big one of our big like tent poles about A4 was like education. Like we're gonna teach these Japanese game developers why and, and Western too to some degree, but Japanese game developers why it's important to actually do good localization and to take the time and spend the money and care about that stuff. So Die Übersetzung japanischer Videospiele hat in den vergangenen Jahren eine wichtige Entwicklung vollzogen. Während man in den 90er Jahren mit stellenweise sehr fragwürdigen Übersetzungen auskommen musste, wird heute gerade durch die Arbeit von Unternehmen wie 84 die textliche Qualität solcher Spiele gewahrt. Dass die Lokalisierung von Spielen aber auch eine Gratwanderung sein kann, zeigt die zum Teil deutliche Kritik westlicher Fans. Gefordert werden meist 1 zu 1 Übersetzungen, die identisch zum japanischen Original ausfallen. Das gilt nicht nur für den Text, sondern auch für alle anderen Aspekte eines Spiels. I mean, like, translation is never going to be one-to-one, -one. and if it is one-to-one, -one, it's bad translation. Like, there's just, it's not an opinion, that's like a fact. Like, if you are taking something from, say, Japanese and putting it into English, literally one-to-one, -one, like super, like some, some, you know, hardcore people want it to be, it's not going to read the way the creators intended. So it's not, you know, faithful in that sense. Like, it's, it, they might be, on, pa on paper it's faithful, but actually it's not, because you, the most important thing to us is that when a player is playing a game in English, they're feeling the same emotions that the player in Japanese was playing when he played it. So, for example, if there's a line that makes you laugh or makes you, you know, just tickles you in a certain way because of a certain wordplay or something like that in Japanese, you know what I mean? Like, you can't just translate that literally because literal translation, people are just gonna be like, oh, what did that mean in Japanese or whatever, you know? You have to find a way to get that across in English that makes people feel the same way. And so, because the word that gets thrown around a lot is censorship, right? And we don't, we're not, like nobody, nobody wants to censor anything. We don't believe in like censorship, but there certainly is a, uh, you know, it is up to the original creators to decide what to do with their content when it goes overseas. And we're not going to fight them on that. Like if they ask us to change something because they want to change it, 
you know, the best thing we could do is just, if, if we really disagree with it, we'll go back and be like, well, you know, consider this. This is what's going to happen. This is how fans are going to react. You might not have thought about this or whatever. Sometimes that will get them to either change their mind or reconsider how they want to do things. And other times they're just like, cool, thanks for the feedback. Now do what we said, you know? And it's like, either way, it's like, okay, we're going to do what you guys want us to do, so. Sprachen und nicht zuletzt Kulturen sind unterschiedlich. Und das zeigt kaum ein anderer Aspekt der Videospielentwicklung wie die Lokalisierung. Es müssen nicht nur auf sprachliche Eigenheiten, sondern vor allem auch auf Originalität geachtet werden, ohne aber den Kern des Originals zu verfälschen. Um diese Aufgabe zu meistern, bedarf es vor allem Vertrauen seitens der Publisher. Ist die Grundlage für eine gute Zusammenarbeit erst einmal gelegt, können in solchen Fällen ganz besondere Projekte entstehen. So geschehen bei Nier, an dem 84 maßgeblich an der Lokalisierung beteiligt war. Um das mal besser für euch zu verbildlichen, das ist das Intro von Nier. Weiß, you dumbass! Start making sense, you rotten book, or you're gonna be sorry. Maybe I'll rip your pages out one by one, or maybe I'll put you in the goddamn furnace. How can someone with such a big smart brain get hypnotized like a little bitch, huh? Oh, Shadow Lord, I love you, Shadow Lord. Come over here and give Vice a big sloppy kiss, Shadow Lord. Now pull your head out of your goddamn ass and start fucking helping us! Nier was a unique case because with Nier, like, we recorded the voices in English first which is not common. Usually the voices will get recorded in Japanese, then we'll get that Japanese audio data and then we'll kind of have a something to go on where, we, okay, we're gonna make the English, you know, sound like this or it has to be this length or whatever, blah, blah, blah. With Nier, we actually did English first and they based the Japanese off the English, which was really cool. We had more freedom than is normal on that project, I would say. And they encouraged us to use it too. I mean, we, of course, we, we're not like, oh, we're just gonna go write our own game. We, we tried to keep it as close to the Japanese as we could, but we definitely had the ability to make things sound natural, which was nice, because sometimes you're super tied to the timing of the Japanese and things are rigid and you can't be as creative as you want to with the writing. But with Nier, we had, we had that. That was a special case. The line you mentioned at the beginning of the game, actually, that's, I think that's only in the English version. I don't think the Japanese version starts with a line from Kaine. And that was Yoko-san, did that himself. He, He joined me in the studio for the recording of the English voices, so he was there when we did that. And the actress who played Kaine uh, basically did that line in one take. Like, we were like, this is a really long line, you got to do it all at once, and it's very intense, you know, we're probably going to be here for a half hour doing it a few times, whatever. And she just nailed it on the first take, and we were all like, wow, she's amazing. And, and Yoko-san was, like, super impressed, too. And I didn't even know he was going to do that. The game came out, and I saw it, and I was like, whoa, that's really cool. He, like, loved the line so much that he, like, put it at the start of the game. 84 gilt mittlerweile als feste Institution in der japanischen Videospiellandschaft, mit einem Portfolio, das sich sehen lassen kann. Das Team arbeitete nicht nur an Nier und Nier Automata, sondern auch an Titeln wie Monster Hunter World, Fire Emblem und Xenoblade Chronicles X. Und das Studio hat noch viel vor. Neben einem erfolgreichen Games Podcast und der Lokalisierung von Spielen, versucht sich das Unternehmen seit einiger Zeit auch als Indie Publisher zu positionieren. Our mission statement for a while and kind of still is was just like do cool do cool shit like let's just do cool things that can benefit people in you know both the west and the east because that's our strength right and like we don't want to become a publisher necessarily for the sake of being a publisher like because it's more like what can we do to offer gamers here that other people can't and so actually the first game that we really got involved with on like sort of a publishing angle was sword and sorcery for ios And then after that, it was like, okay, well, you know, we'll do, we'll keep doing this publishing thing when it makes sense, when there's something cool that we feel like the game deserves the sort of best treatment it can get here. And if it falls in someone else's hands, maybe they're not going to be able to do it justice. And so that's why we worked on Shovel Knight. We love that game. We also worked on Super Time Force, like not like a big thing in Japan or anything, but we love the game. We love Cappy. Um, we did Rogue Legacy here, uh, which is another cool game. Uh, and then, as you said, we did Undertale recently, which actually is really popular in Japan, which is great. But, um, you know, all of that is like stuff that it's really more like we're not coming at it like, oh, let's try and be a successful publisher. More just like, let's make sure these games are done justice here in Japan. And, and by doing that, we can hopefully make Japan understand how awesome games are, you know, in the West. Because a lot of times games get localized into Japanese and the localization is not very good. It's like it was for us when we were kids, like just something that's bad. And it's like, if you're going to play this awesome game, you should feel the intention of the original creators when you play it. And so you should be able to play it in a way where it feels almost like it was made for Japan to begin with, you know. Um, that's kind of our thing, I think, with publishing. It's like we just want to sort of 
bring cool experiences here. And you'll see there's a theme with a lot of the games we've brought over anyway. It's like games that were clearly influenced by Japanese games, right? Like these are games where like the guys who made them growing up were inspired by Japanese developers. And it's like, it would be a shame for that to come back to Japan in a way where it's like all janky and like, you know, ugly fonts or like, you know, bad localization or anything. We don't want that. So like, that's kind of our thing with publishing. Mit Shovel Knight, Sword and Sorcery und nicht zuletzt Undertale darf 84 einige der größten Erfolge in Japan anbieten, den der Indie-Markt aktuell zu bieten hat. Das Portfolio umfasst derzeit aber ausschließlich westliche Indie-Titel. Aktuell hinkt die japanische Indie-Bewegung im Vergleich zur stark wachsenden westlichen Szene hinterher. Zwar erfahren Indie-Spiele gerade durch Übersetzung von großen Erfolgen wie Undertale immer stärkere Akzeptanz. Für ein Land, das man für seine originellen Spiele kennt, ist aber noch deutlich Luft nach oben. Sure. But like you said earlier, there's not as big of a there's not as big of a scene for it here. I mean there's certainly a scene. That's why Bit Summit was started, right? Bit Summit is Kyoto Indie Games Festival where I mean a lot of the games shown there are games from the West, but also you do see a lot of stuff. People developers here, indie developers in Japan coming out of the woodwork to kind of show their little games and stuff, but um yeah, the scene's just not as big, but it'll it'll get there, I feel like. I think it's just gonna be a while. Like it's one of those things where the it made sense for it to blow up in the West the way it did. I mean, it kind of started on Xbox, right? Xbox 360 was like sort of where you did your indie thing for a while. It's because they made it accessible to people and possible, and it was also a very successful platform. And like now in Japan, it just so happens that there's so much stuff in the West that that's taking up most of the indie space here. But, I, you know, I think it'll grow. I think it'll get better. I think we'll see more of it. Um, from from really small things like one guy to like you know companies like you games or whatever who are a, I mean they are independent but they're they're a pretty large company and they're still doing stuff too so I think the scene will grow it'll just take a little while Auch wenn die Indie Szene in Japan gerade noch im Aufbau ist ganz ohne Indie Entwickler steht das Land nicht da Den Beweis dafür liefert Kyoto eine Stadt die nicht nur für ihre ländliche Gegend sondern mit Tokio und Osaka auch als Entwicklerhochburg bekannt ist Neben großen Studios wie Nintendo finden wir hier beispielsweise auch Q Games. Ein Indie-Studio, das von Dylan Cuthbert gegründet wurde. Cuthbert begann seine Karriere als Teenager für den Entwickler Argonaut, für den er unter anderem 3D-Grafiken auf dem allerersten Gameboy programmierte. Eine Leistung, die Nintendo so sehr beeindruckte, dass kurz darauf eine Zusammenarbeit mit Argonaut gestartet wurde. Ziel dieser Zusammenarbeit, 3D-Spiele für das Super Nintendo. I mean, really, Nintendo wasn't that big a company back then. Uh, there were probably only about 20 or 30 people in Yokoi's group and about 20 or 30 people in uh, the group that Miyamoto was in. And Miyamoto didn't run the group at that point. Um, so he was uh, more like a sort of director of the group rather than the boss of the group. And, uh, and I think um, back then it could, things would move a lot quicker because of that. And so. While we're in that meeting, um, they showed us prototype versions of like Super Mario World and uh, F Zero and Pilot Swings. And on Pilot Swings, they, well, Miyamoto was saying that he wanted a 3D chip to actually make things work on it, um, rather than having to draw all the sprites by hand for all the angles of the, the aircraft or the hang gliders or whatever. And um, they ended up um, signing Argonaut to do the chip, um, combined with uh, a guy called Ben Cheese who came from a, a company called Flare Technology. And they're all from like the Cambridge area and developed the Spectrum and uh, you know, old 8-bit computers like that. And so they came on board and um, Nintendo signed Argonaut up to do three games for that chip. Cuthbert zog für dieses Projekt nach Japan, um direkt aus Nintendos Firmenzentrale in Kyoto zu operieren. Während seiner Zeit bei Nintendo entwickelte er als Teil des Entwicklerteams nicht nur erfolgreich den Super FX Chip, sondern wirkte auch an einem der größten Spiele mit, das von diesem 3D Chip Gebrauch machen sollte. Star Fox Mit Star Fox leistete man nicht nur wichtige Pionierarbeit, sondern auch einen Erfolg. Der Titel gilt bis heute als einer der wichtigsten Spiele der 16-Bit-Ära und wurde von Kritikern und Spielern gleichermaßen positiv aufgenommen. Es dauerte damit nicht lange, bis Nintendo Cuthberts Team mit der Entwicklung eines Nachfolgers beauftragte. Star Fox 2 wurde innerhalb weniger Jahre komplett fertiggestellt und nie veröffentlicht. I spent probably like 
maybe a couple of years making Star Fox 2 um, and we put a lot of um, we done a lot of experimentation with it at the beginning all kinds of different ideas and we kind of distilled it all down and I think we made a pretty interesting like a uh, very unique kind of game at the end of it and it wasn't quite the same as the original Star Fox really um, and it involved a lot more ideas and a lot of that was driven really by Miyamoto himself um, because he wanted uh, Star Fox to be very much about experimenting with different things in 3D at that point and so we had like a you know there were little platformer elements and there was uh, like a little bit of a rogue element and in general it was a very much a kind of um, like a, an interesting framework for a game, I think. And uh, then at the end of that, um, the PlayStation had just come out and the Saturn had just come out. And there was this rivalry between Sony and Nintendo at the time. And so Nintendo at that point just didn't want to release anything that looked worse than anything that's on the new Sony platform. You know, there was quite, it was quite um, a harsh rivalry, I think. When it got to the point where Mimoto told me that about you know Star Fox 2 uh, not being released, I was like, well, and he gave me the reasons for it. I was like, well, I can understand that. You know, I had a PlayStation at home, mm. and uh, the, the the 3D quality was you know way you know the bar was way higher, mm. and uh, and so I kind of I I personally also didn't really want to be compared with that at the time, and so releasing it now is quite good because more people have gotten about that race, you know, the, the race for 3D graphics. And so it's not, you don't get the weird comparisons now. So people just play it and go, oh, this was a game that was made in this period with this hardware. And they're not saying, oh, but the PlayStation's better, you know, which is what they would have said back in uh, 95, you know, when we were thinking of releasing it. Nachdem die Zusammenarbeit zwischen Nintendo und Argonaut endete, war Cuthbert's Zeit beim Konsolenhersteller vorbei. Statt aber in die Heimat zurückzukehren, baute sich der Entwickler nach einem weiteren Engagement bei Sony Playstation, die Grundlage für sein eigenes Studio, Q Games. Das Team feierte vor allem durch seine Pixel-Junk-Serie große Erfolge und konnte sich so als feste Größe in der japanischen Videospielwelt etablieren. Zusätzlich wurde auch die Zusammenarbeit mit Nintendo wieder aufgenommen, um beispielsweise am 3DS-Remake von Star Fox 64 zu arbeiten. Mit der Playstation 4 wagte sich das Studio aber endgültig in neue Gefilde und entwickelte ein Online-Spiel, das sich nicht um den Spieler, sondern primär um die Community dreht. Die Welt von Tomorrow Children stach mit seiner ungewöhnlichen Optik und bizarren Atmosphäre hervor, auch wenn die Idee des Spiels nicht jedem zu Beginn klar war. When the PlayStation 4 was initially talked about or when we were told about it, um, they would always go on about like the share feature and how it's uh, everything is about sharing. There's going to be a share button on the controller, you know, share, 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 share. And I was thinking about sharing. And we had this, um, in, in the back of my mind, I had this kind of Russian, you know, sort of Soviet kind of um, thing that I wanted to do. So I thought, well, Marxism is kind of a form of sharing. So let's try and make a game that is all about sharing and like, you know, um, having a, a communal trust, I suppose. And so one of the things in the game that uh, is a really interesting point I think, is when you're sort of mining in the game. So you build your towns and stuff um, you know, for the greater good. So one really interesting part, point though is when um, you go out to the islands and you're mining and you've picked up a whole ton of stuff, uh, at some point you, you know, your inventory is full, you can't carry anything more. So even though you're doing the work to do the mining, you're, you're kind of uh, leaving uh, the resources lying around and then other players will come pick them up. When the other players take your stuff, you're like, oi, that's my stuff. And so the first couple of hours is about, still about that and you're kind of fighting your ego. And then after a little while, you're, you change, like you watch the players and they change and they become more um, communal minded. And the, the change in mindset is really interesting. And so um, a lot of people uh, playing in if they don't get to that mindset, then they're like, oh, I don't really understand the game. Because all games, um, all other games, tend to be about you and only you. So like, you know, you do something, you get something, and you don't give it to anybody else. It's like, it's yours. And you know, that's, that adds up to your player's status or whatever. But in this game, it was more about um, the more you can get other players to do stuff, 
the more that benefits you in the, in the end. Das außergewöhnliche Konzept von Tomorrow Children ging zum Teil tatsächlich auf. Spieler versammelten sich online, um Materialien abzubauen, Strom zu erzeugen und große Monster abzuwehren. Nicht um primär ihren Charakter zu verstärken, sondern vielmehr um ihre Stadt und Community weiterzuentwickeln. Das Spiel konnte sich über Monate eine kleine Nische aufbauen, auch wenn diese letzten Endes nicht groß genug war. Der Titel schaffte es nicht ausreichend Nutzer zu erreichen, um Server- und Entwicklerkosten zu decken. Damit eilte das Spiel ein ähnliches Schicksal wie schon Star Fox 2. Es wurde eingestellt. Well, that was basically we it was a free to play game basically and the with a free to play game and with with running server costs you always have to it's always a juggle between trying to uh, monetize the game uh, which puts off players at the same time and uh, making the game better for being the game itself and also affording the cost of the servers at the same time and for us it was like always a bit of a juggle and we could never get quite get the right um, balance so the money earned would be enough to cover the servers um, and so that's why they ended up uh, having to shut it down it wasn't because it was actually it wasn't because it wasn't popular so for example we had um, players in there who have played that game more hours than I've ever seen anybody play any game so we're talking like you know like a thousand hours uh, but we just couldn't we, we couldn't really iterate enough to work out a way to uh, get them to pay enough to cover like the server costs so like if they're playing it for a thousand hours and obviously there's a server cost involved with that and well it, I suppose monetization kind of went against our kind of principle as well a little bit and so it, it was a bit tricky to to balance all that and that's that what ultimately ended in uh, you know caused it to Fail, basically. Yeah. Die japanische Games-Industrie hat sich in den letzten Jahren immer weiter verändert. Eine starke Verbreitung von Smartphones hat den Markt für Mobile Games so schnell wachsen lassen, dass dieser in Japan Konsolen und PC-Spieler überholt hat und mittlerweile die Ertragsquelle Nummer 1 darstellt. Das Interesse von Spielern und Entwicklern hat sich dementsprechend verändert. Entwickler kehren dem Kernmarkt immer weiter den Rücken, um die Nachfrage im Mobile-Sektor zu befriedigen. Und genau das stellt eine Herausforderung für die Teams dar, die weiterhin an traditionellen Konsolen oder PC-Spielen festhalten wollen, inklusive Indie-Titeln. In Japan, if you only think about the Japan market anyway, you kind of make games what you've grown up with. And Japan had mobile games way before uh, the West, like really early. You know, I mean, in the West it all kind of exploded really with, you know, after the iPhone and that sort of set up the thing. But in in uh, Japan it was all from like you know like the year 2000 onwards and I think people grew up with those from a long time before the West did and so I think uh, that's why you see a decline in, in people willing to buy even the PlayStation 3 so from, from the PlayStation 3 onwards there was kind of like this decline that came in where it wasn't selling as well as like the PlayStation 2 did in Japan and the reason was because most gamers had already gone to the more easier games or the easier to access games that which were on their phones. Indie games come in all shapes and sizes and there's no one standard, they're not all 2D, they're not all 3D, but I mean, let's face it, a lot of games that have been popular in recent years are relatively low budget. I don't mean that in a, in a bad way, but I mean literally, they're not spending that much money. I feel like the skills that are have lent been lent to like a lot of these games that are really successful like a lot of big ga indie games in the west you've got you've got undertale you've got night in the woods you've got uh you know recently people are talking about celeste when we're recording this uh those people who have those skills are all making indie games in the west whereas a lot of those developers in japan are working on mobile games doing the same thing they're putting 2d graphics in and they're doing stuff but they're making they're trying to make their money i guess on the mobile scene which is kind of just makes sense for japan because a lot of people have gone moved away from consoles and and PC was never really a big thing here never like the way it is in the west and and mostly people play games on mobile Der Mobile Markt wird in den nächsten Jahren auch weiterhin eine treibende Kraft in Japan bleiben und einen großen Teil der Entwicklertalente beanspruchen. Das bedeutet aber nicht, dass die japanische Indie Szene völlig ausbleibt, auch wenn sie im Vergleich zum Westen deutlich kleiner ausfällt, 
entstehen hier bereits diverse Spiele, die von kleinen Teams entwickelt werden. Dazu gehören nicht nur Konsolen oder Mobile Games, sondern auch PC-Spiele, die eine immer größere Akzeptanz bei den japanischen Spielern erfahren. Q-Games wird trotz Rückschlägen wie die Einstellung von Tomorrow Children weiter daran arbeiten, einen Teil des Indie-Marktes in Japan zu repräsentieren. Und damit sind sie nicht alleine. Vor allem ein Entwickler hat es sich zur Aufgabe gemacht, Spiele zu produzieren, wie sie nur aus Japan kommen können. Wir reisen nach Osaka, um den Gründer von White Owls zu treffen. Sein Name, Hiditaka Suheru, auch bekannt als Swery65. Mal. 僕は結構海外に毎年行くこと多いんですけどその海外の方がいらっしゃってその日本らしいものを見たければ京都とかに行けばいいと思うんですよ。で、えっと、最新の日本の事情を知りたければとか満員電車とか見たいんだったら東京行けばいいと思うんですけどこう人と人が触れ合ってた,ただただ楽しく過ごそうと思ったらここ大阪が僕は一番いいと思うんですね。そういうい意味で人人が人とつながりやすい街だからここから発信のエンターテインメントゲームみたいなものが作れないかっていうのが僕はここにこだわってる理由ですね。Swery ist ein Entwickler, den es mittlerweile nicht mehr allzu häufig in Japan gibt. Jemand, der die Öffentlichkeit und den direkten Kontakt mit den Spielern sucht, ohne die Scheu auch mal zu polarisieren. Und das spiegeln auch seine Werke wider. Swery Spiele sind nicht dafür bekannt, fabelhaft auszusehen oder technisch zu glänzen. Stattdessen zeichnen seine Projekte ungewöhnliche Charaktere oder Geschichten aus, die sich auch mal trauen, dem Spieler vor den Kopf zu stoßen. Swery Spiele sind anders und vor allem eins: weird. Nahodo. Etto, ma GDC no Koen toka demo ikutsu ka hana shi 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 65個のポイントを話しましまたそのうちの今日は2つぐらいだけ話すとすると、えー、1つはキャラクター、えー、プレイヤーがどういうふうに感情を抱くか怒るとかつまらないとか面白いとか悲しいとかっていうことをまずコントロールできるようにゲーム全体を、えー、考えてます。でもう1つは、えー、っとゲームなのでインタラクティブ必ず操作があるっていうところでそのインタラクティブに対して。都合のいい操作を割り当てないっていうかこのボタンはこういう意味っていうのをゲームを一貫して同じ意味になるように考えて作ってます、まあ、あとはそのメモの取り方も多分テクニックがあってそのおかしな人を考えてくださいおかしなキャラクターを考えてくださいって言った時にみんな明らかにおかしな人を探しに行く明らかにおかしな人を探しに行くけどそれだとおかしなキャラクターにならないのでえっと普通に見えるけど実は変みたいなところを一生懸命ちゃんと探さないとダメなんかカッコつけるとカッコつけて言うとカッコつけた言い方するとシェイクスピアはえっと変わった人とは違ったようになりたいと思うこと自体それはもう平凡だっていう言葉があるのでその普通をいかに見つけるかっていうところがポイントだと思う。Was ist weird? Was ist normal? Swery nutzt diese Fragen für seine Spiele und lässt sie ineinander verschwimmen. Das Ergebnis sind meist Welten, die man selten auf den ersten Blick greifen kann, dafür aber umso belohnender sind, wenn man sich mit ihnen auseinandersetzt. Diese Philosophie verfolgte Swery mit kaum einem anderen Spiel so sehr wie mit Deadly Premonition, ein Horrorabenteuer, das sich Einflüssen aus Serien wie Twin Peaks zu eigen macht und sie mit seiner Handschrift vermischt. Deadly Premonition ist Swerys wohl bekanntestes Spiel und laut Guinness World Records das polarisierendste Horror-Adventure aller Zeiten. Ja, da, 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 2日後ぐらいかなデストラクトレードで100点もらってその時にうわーすげえやったやっぱりなーって思ってその時もまた飲みに行きましたえっとまああのいろんなところからもちろん変化はあったんですけど一番僕がびっくりしたのはえっと朝起きたらかな土曜日の朝に日本の起きてツイッターを見たらそれまでフォロワーが僕友達の6人しかいなかったんですけど朝起きたら160人に増えてて何やこれって見たら全部英語なんですよ。あれと思って
でツイッターがもうハッキングされたと思ってそれが一番最初の印象ですでその時にまだ英語も読めないし英語も分からなかったから見てでうちの奥さんに見せて奥さんがこれ見てなんかいいこと言ってるっぽいよって言ったから一生懸命そこから翻訳してあこれはもしかしてと思って調べたらジムの記事が出てきたそこで。Deadly Premonition hat mit seinen ungewöhnlichen Wertungen eine regelrechte Welle ausgelöst und seinen Entwickler über Nacht berühmt gemacht. Ob das Spiel wirklich ein Meisterwerk oder doch nur Mittelmaß ist, kann bis heute niemand beantworten. Und das muss zum Glück auch niemand. Deadly Premonition ist ein Phänomen, das seinen festen Platz in der Videospielkultur hat und Swery auf den Radar diverse Publisher brachte. Darunter Microsoft. Dark Dreams Don't Die, kurz D4, sollte das nächste Spiel von Suhiro sein. Exklusiv für die Xbox-Konsole. えっとで、最初GDC行った時にマイクロソフトの担当の方が講演を見に来てくださっててその後にランチに行ったんですその時に僕のビジョンがいかにえっと今のゲーム業界に必要かっていうのをすごく説明をして無理やり口説いた感じ
っとまあ、実際は、えっと、1年ぐらいかお,お休みもらってたんですけどその間まず最初は仕事がしたいゲームが作りたい会社が気になるっていうふうに感じで1ヶ月間ぐらいは本当に落ち着かなかったんですよ。でも1ヶ月経ったぐらい無理やり休もうって決めて1ヶ月経ったぐらいからあのだんだん気持ちが落ち着いてきて徐々に生活が変化していきましたね。最初はそれを変えるためにえっと携帯電話の通じない親戚の家の山の上にあるお寺に泊まりに行ったりしてわざと情報を手に入れないようにしてだんだん気持ちを落ち着けるようなことをしないとダメだった。でもそれがができるようになったらいろんなことが見えてきて。次のステップに行こうっていうきっかけになった1年間だったと思うでその1年間の間に、えっと、去年ねちょうどクロアチアで同じ内容の講演したんですけどその1年間の間にいろいろやりましたえっと小説の第一項ドラフトを書いてで、えー、お坊さんの住職の資格を取ってで大学と産学共同で VR のプロジェクトを始めてでインドとクロアチアで講演をしてでホワイトアウルの会社を作る準備をした。スウェリー65は、今日の日本に戻ってきて、ビデオインドストリーを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それを作って、それ Ähnlich wie Suhero musste die japanische Games-Industrie diverse Wandel vollziehen, um sich an stetige Änderungen anzupassen. Gerade der Wechsel von der SD zur HD-Entwicklung schien dem japanischen Konsolenmarkt schwer zu fallen, der zusätzlich mit einem immer größeren Mobile-Sektor zu kämpfen hatte. Die Folge waren Titel, die den japanischen Charme vermissen ließen und sich immer weiter westlichen Spielen annäherten. Es sollte Jahre dauern, bis sich japanische Entwickler daran angepasst hatten. Und durch eine Rückbesinnung auf ihre Stärken ihr Selbstbewusstsein wieder erlangten. Ich habe mich in der Zeit, 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 日本のゲーム業界のことを悩んでるって話をしたらそんな大きな悩みは抱えなくていいから自分のやりたいことをやって自分だけが得したらいいって言われてすごい気が楽になって会社をもう一回作ろうと思ったんですねそこで。The problem really was like cost and, and the labor like the skill set in the, in、like、the labor pool in Japan hadn't quite caught up to,、um, the, to the, the high tech required for Utilizing like the PlayStation 3 to its fullest or the PlayStation 4 to its fullest.、Um, and I think that's, that created a bit of a, a gap. That happens in anything in life. Like when you lose your confidence in something, it's like, oh shit, like what am I going to do now? I, I have to survive, but like how do I? And so remember like Dead Rising came out and it was like, hey, collaborating with the West is great. Look, look what you could do and Lost Planet and stuff. And, and Inafune san from at the time Capcom was, was saying, you know, a lot of like, oh, Japanese games are, are dying or blah, blah, blah. A lot of that was coming from, I think, the sort of the spirit or the confidence had gone away. And when, when they were scrambling to figure out a solution, the solution was, oh, well, let's, we, collaborating with the West must be the way to go. And that led to some cool stuff, but a lot of really weird, shitty games, too. And like, I think what happened is, as, as things calmed down, and unfortunately there were casualties, right? We lost a few companies, we lost some people, you know.、Um, fortunately, like I said, I feel like the mobile boom brought money back into Japan and allowed for some companies to sort of survive during this dark time and start building back. And I feel like now confidence is, is growing again because, like, in the last few years, we've seen some amazing games coming out of Japan and, like, that sort of quirkiness that was asleep for a little while is, is, is bouncing back. And,、um, You know, I feel like, I feel like the worst is definitely behind us in that sense. まあ多分こうじゃないかなと思うのはメーカーはカプコンとかえっと任天堂とかスクエアとかああいう HD をやれてるメーカーっていうのはその間に自分たちで研究をして自分たちはやってるでもそれでは時間がかかるのでえっとお金を稼がなきゃならないからその稼ぐプロジェクトはアウトソーシングで作る。アウトソーシングのプロジェクトは売れるプロジェクトじゃないといけないので SD ですぐお金になるものを作るっていうサイクルでだから今現在も HD ができているのはそのちゃんとしたメーカーのところだけで
、えー、そうじゃないところっていうのは苦労してるんじゃないかなと思うけどそうだから大きい会社からはそのモンスターハンターワールドとかファイナルファンタジー15とかが出てくるけれども彼らはそれを作るためにやっぱりその5年10年かかったんじゃないかなと思うけど実際に彼らもでその間の、えっと、実際会社を回すプロジェクトっていうのは日本とたくさんの他のプロジェクトがやってたんじゃないかな。The key things about Japan is that there isn't like an overall identity as such. And if you look at games from like、uh, from a bit further back, like play, from the PlayStation era, the, the range of genres that you've got is quite huge. And each company is trying different things, even if they are a bit, some of them might be a bit crazy, some of them might be a bit normal, but in general,、um, the, the range is, is pretty large. And it's not all pigeonholed into, like, you know, as I mentioned earlier, like FPS. Style games because、um, there's no need to,、uh, to do that. I think it's also important, though, I don't know, not to like, you know, there used to be this thing, oh, those crazy Japanese guys, whatever. It's not like that. It's just they were taking risks and trying interesting things and being creative and not being held back by like, you know, usual, uh, uh, you know, Uh, standards or whatever, you know, it's okay to be different and weird. But I, I think we're at a point now where the, the rest of the world has sort of acknowledged that too. So I don't think it's like in danger anymore. Like, I think, especially with indie games and how prolific they've become, and how, you know, to me, a lot of the most interesting games lately are indie because they're just trying new things. Because I don't, people don't want the same thing every year anymore. That used to be Japan, right? It used to be like, remember the PS1 days when like J- J- Sony Japan was doing all these cool, weird things like the Mosquito game or Parappa the Rapper or like, You were getting games for a wider audience. That has always been something that was really big about Japan and it still is and will continue to, I hope will continue to be so. Was für ein Land ist Japan? Einige beschreiben es als Land, in dem Videospiele gelernt haben, Geschichten zu erzählen. Geschichten, die Spieler auf der ganzen Welt inspiriert und maßgeblich geprägt haben. Um diesen Status beizubehalten, musste die japanische Videospielkultur Risiken eingehen. Das Ergebnis sind Welten, die den Zauber alter Spiele aufleben lassen und gleichzeitig ihre eigene Identität zelebrieren. Egal auf welcher Plattform, diese Geschichten waren und sind ein wichtiger Teil unserer heutigen Kultur. Geschichten made in Japan. <lacht>